Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so it's uh, uh, my pleasure to introduce Steve Greenberg. Uh, he um, has been doing uh, speech research, human and machine, for 20, 30 years. Uh, uh, forever. Forever, okay. Um, so he's, uh, this week he's visiting University of Washington. Um, so we took the opportunity to invite him to come over to uh, give us some uh, information about uh, this uh, very exciting topic that probably will, uh, will, uh, will attract a lot of interest uh, uh, by many people here. Um, um, so Steve um, has been working in speech since when? Since uh, 80s uh, at University of Wisconsin and also University of California at Berkeley. And now he's, um, I think, running your company called the Silicon Speech. He also has an affiliation with uh, these two universities, uh, Technical University of Denmark as well as University of California at Berkeley. And he, I think he spent most of his time in East, uh, what's it, East International Ixi? Ixi, yeah. So in, in California, or, or something I forgot. And one of the famous work that he has been doing uh, was, uh, well, I don't know what he's still doing, that is transcription of spontaneous speech, uh, a project known as um, Switchboard Transcription Project that most people in the speech field uh, knows quite a lot about. Um, so today we're going to hear uh, his more recent research on uh, human speech recognition and, and, and the relationship between that to machine speech recognition. So I'll give the floor to Steve. Okay, Steve. Thank you, uh, Lee, uh, for that very nice introduction. I don't do transcription anymore because machines have made us redundant. And someday machines will make all of us redundant. Um, so I've been doing speech recognition uh, and perception since I was probably about three months old. So it's been more than 30 years. Anyway, um, there are some of you who may be looking, who may be listening remotely. So hello out there. Um, I guess, can they answer, can they ask questions? No, I don't think Okay, well. We used to, but yeah, we used to. So just send your questions and comments, particularly if they're hostile, to Lee, and he'll forward them to me. Okay, so um, this talk is titled something different when I give it to an academic audience. I wanted to try to tune this talk to people who work in machine recognition. So if you have further questions, questions about some of the topics, you can just go on to my website there. I think you've all seen the abstract. What I normally title this talk is Linguistic Scene Analysis and the Importance of Synergy, and you'll see why. So these slides are sort of background slides, and I don't really think you need to, um, for me to go over this in detail. The conventional approach that's used still in speech recognition by machine is time frame by time frame. Phones, phonetic segments are associated with each time frame. And the auditory system is supposed to do a detailed spectral analysis. You can use PLP or Melkepstrel features or something else. And then the machine matches the auditory, uh, the acoustic spectrum representation to templates for phones, and you won't know all this. Um, what is wrong with the conventional wisdom? That's why I'm here. I'm going to tell you what you're doing wrong in terms of a principled approach and what you could do differently if um, you're allowed the flexibility to try different things. So what's wrong with the conventional wisdom? First of all, it's way too rigid. It can't account for how listeners actually decode speech in the real world, so if you're trying to develop machines that will replace all of us eventually, it won't work. Okay, so it can't account for listeners' ability to understand speech in a wide range of environments, including this. And it also can't account for the huge variability in the way in which people speak. So these data are from a study that I published 
nearly 10 years ago, in which we look at the number of different word pronunciations for common words. These are in terms of rank order for the switchboard corpus, this telephone dialogue corpus, where you have often dozens of different pronunciations for these common words, where the most common pronunciation ranges between 10 and 50 percent. So huge amounts of variability, which we normally don't have trouble decoding the spoken language, but it's difficult for speech recognition systems. And as you know, some of you may work on pronunciation models. You know that there is a lot of time and effort and black art involved. So, so that effect came from the Yeah, there's a paper from 1999 called Speaking in Shorthand. And that's on my website, as is virtually everything else I'm talking about. And if not, just send me a mail and I'll send it to you. So uh, what else is wrong? Well, this spectral approach, where you essentially assume that the auditory system does a very fine-grained analysis of the acoustic spectrum, and then you associate that with some sort of linguistic unit. One reason why this can't possibly be the way humans do this in the real world is that you can throw out 80% of the spectrum. So the distance between this upper limit of this slit and the lower limit of that slit is actually compressed. It's actually an octave. We've thrown out 80% of the spectrum, and all we're doing now is sampling uh, a third octave band, which is the critical bandwidth, a critical integration interval in the low, mid, and high frequencies. And it sort of sounds like this individually. Did anyone understand that? I didn't. Um, so now if you, uh, you get between 2 and 9% intelligibility over headphones, um, if you combine slits, more speech-like, okay, all four slits, over headphones, if you're a native speaker of American English, you get about 90% of the words. People do speech. Uh, the HMI, the standard machine speech, can to see how much degradation it might have. Because if you cut only a portion of speech, I think all it does, it probably just adds some variance in whatever standard speech signal it might have. Well, in capital coefficient, for instance. Okay, so. It's completely wipe out speech because you still have a lot of information there. It's true, but I think the, pers the closest uh, experiment in speech recognition to this was Hina Kermansky, who misunderstood something that Takuyuki Alai, who was a postdoc with me at the time, who helped do this research with me. Um, there was a report in 1995 by Dick Warren who claimed that a single very narrow slit at 1500 hertz, you got 70% of the words right. Turned out that was an artifact. Uh, when you did it right, as we did, you get about 10%. And he just didn't realize that his signal processing was defective, and he actually had a very broad band width of speech, so it was actually giving several octaves worth of material. Um, but Hinek used something called traps. These, and these traps were these slits. And originally he thought, I've solved the problem. Um, but it turned out that they don't really give you that good a recognition of even the phones. You have to combine several slits. So it actually just validated what uh, we've done for humans that you actually need information from different parts of the acoustic spectrum. In my view, so Lee asked me to talk about theory, and most of that I'm going to reserve to the end, because I want you to understand the empirical database for why my uh, sort of models of human speech perception are the way they are. It's not that you're decoding the spectrum. The spectrum is a medium, a distribution medium, for giving you different modulation patterns that are complementary to each other. And in that sense, the detailed spectrum is not important. You're not f tracking form and patterns either. What you really need is to basically 
get modulation patterns like this, from the low frequencies like this, from the high frequencies like this, from the mid frequencies. When you put them all together, as you have here for four slits, which gives you about 90% of the words correctly decoded, notice that the modulation patterns look very similar to the original, but 80% of the spectrum is gone. So it's as if, if you capture the essence of the modulations distributed across the acoustic frequency axis, you've captured most of the message part of the signal. It doesn't sound the same. The most recent geological survey found seismic activity. The most recent geological survey found seismic activity. But it's intelligible. And since we're interested here in the essence, what underlies intelligibility, and you're in interested in decoding uh, the phonetic and the lexical units, you don't care about the naturalness, I assume. Well, my, my question is that if you look at the fossil compound, and then if you were to use that to do human recognition, you have a little bit lower intelligibility. It can be the same one. Right? Yes, yeah, so <laughs> this is not robust. So in noise, it would not work. If you were to put the same kind of signal, a fossil compound over there, into recognition, mm. that takes away certain part of the special information. And all it does is that it actually just simply reduce some part of the information you know, by adding some of the variances into original signal. Yes. Since you don't cut a lot, you still you could train, a lot. You could train your recognition system so to do very well on that speech. If they do, they, that means... You know, yeah, Barry Chen, okay. who was a student at ICSI around the time I left, he actually tried to do some recognition experiments testing these ideas. I don't think he was extraordinarily successful in terms of um, generalizing to slit speech. But if you train just on slit speech and you had particularly limited vocabulary, sure, it probably would work. Because it's a pattern recognition task. Drop, but won't drop yeah, that's right. Yeah. OK, so a little bit more theory. I'm not going to go much into this, but um, what I think people often don't understand is that there's no single magic unit, no single time span. So speech recognition systems basically conceptualize the task as, hey, we have words, and we have segments, what they call phones. Um, but actually, there are many other components of spoken language that are extremely important, prosody, which I'll talk about a little bit later on, which has to do with syllable weights, whether I'm talking about a stressed syllable or an unstressed syllable in terms of whether it's emphasized or not. There's intonation, which is also often part of this in terms of allowing you to parse a phrase. There are micro features, like the difference between two sounds could be in terms of whether the vocal cords are vibrating or not, and I'll get back to that later on in the talk. And there are the raw acoustics, and there are other dimensions which I haven't described in this slide here. So in that sense, from the ASL point of view, it's an oversimplification of what spoken language is about. And so you have very clever engineering and very sophisticated mathematical models to try to decode a, sig um, a signal based on a very raw, oversimplified model of spoken language. So you really are making your life very difficult by using just words and phones. And I think you all know that. Um, so what I'm going to try to convince you of is that there are advantages long term of looking at more micro things like articulatory acoustic features, which I'll describe shortly, as well as a link to the prosodic parts which span several syllables. And you might want to just think about that for the future, which might be 10 years from now, but you've got to start sometime. OK, so linguistic scene analysis is what I call the process by which a listener analyzes and most importantly interprets the acoustic and visual sensory streams. Very important, the interpretation part. And this is something which <coughs> you don't really deal very well with, in my opinion, in ASR either. You have language models, and you have training material. But the interpretation where the same acoustic signal 
could in fact be associated with completely different messages depending on the context. This is, I think, a very important problem for the long term if you want to emulate human speech perception. Also, um, there are these hidden dimensions. And what this really means is that there are certain things that are not in the acoustics. They're not in the visual cues. And you off, they're just not observable in terms of the speech you're trying to decode. But they're operating in the background. What do I mean by that? Memory, motivation, temperament, uh, context that actually often helps decode the speech signal if you're a human, which machines often don't have. And this complicates your task a lot. So I'm not going to talk about that here. There's work I do with Oded Gitsa, who is at Boston University in Sensometrics in the, uh, New England. And we have a project funded by the Air Force on brain rhythms in speech recognition speech perception by humans. And we're looking at some of these hidden variables. But that's a different talk. But I think you should keep this in mind. Memory, access to what are those units that are being recognized. You would have no idea for any given human until you have some feedback. So what is your machine going to do? So context is, in my opinion, all important that without it, the sensory streams are difficult, if not impossible, to interpret. And you get around this by having language models and having lots of training. And I don't mean just grammar and semantics. I mean also the behavioral situation. Uh, the story that my former colleague Nelson Morgan tells is walking down a street, and he has a small radio up to his ear. And someone from across the street yells something. He has. N he can't decode the acoustic signal, but he immediately answers, shouts back the baseball score, because it was during the World Series. Why? Because he knew that the only rational interpretation of this indecipherable acoustics, given the situation, was the person was asking for the baseball score. He could not decode the acoustic signal, but he still got the answer correct. OK. so. The other thing that I want to point out, and this is actually going to form the focus of my talk, is that linear models cannot or are unlikely to predict the amount of speech intelligibility under many conditions that are of real interest to us. And I'm going to show you some examples of this. And so this is where synergy comes in. And I'm going to show you some examples of linearity quantitatively as well as nonlinearity quantitatively in terms of real speech decoding. And so I believe we need new models, new mathematical models, as well as new models, computational models in general, for understanding speech where synergy is key. And I'm going to explain to you exactly what I mean by that shortly. So essentially, synergy occurs when two or more streams or features combine to provide far more information than you would predict from the linear summation. And I'm going to show you some examples of exactly what I mean. Um, so here's one. Um, this, these data are only 55 years old. And so it's been well known that the same acoustic signal, same acoustics embedded in a sentence is often 15 or 20 decibels more intelligible, which is huge relative to the same acoustics presented in isolation here. Why? OK, so one reason is that listeners don't decode uh, one word at a time normally. We know that because you can excerpt individual words from spoken sentences. This is a different experiment from the 60s. And it turns out that you need three words um, together often, sometimes even more, to be able to accurately decode the words. And the question is, why? So most people would say, well, you have grammar and semantics, and you basically are able to bootstrap from uh, putting it all together in terms of this semantic grammatical context. 
I don't think that's the whole story. In fact, I don't even think it's, it's the large uh, component. This study, which was done only 20 years ago, shows that the advantage of combining words in a sentence for decoding largely disappears if those individual words have two or more syllables. Now, Lee earlier said, oh, I can explain that because it has to do with the statistics of polysyllabic words. I could do an experiment to test this idea where we vary the frequency and the complexity. It's just a confusion. Right? Yes. The discriminability. Yeah, the end, essentially the entry. Yes, and um, in the 1999 paper, I provide a fair amount of word frequency data uh, for that switchboard corpus, and I don't disagree that it's not one explanation, but I'm going to suggest another uh, potential factor involved here, which I think is much more interesting. Because if you're completely right, it's not interesting, <laughs> scientifically. It's interesting engineering-wise. But if there's something else going on here, then I think it is interesting scientifically. So if you, on this graph, when you're saying one syllable, you're one, two, or three, four one-syllable words. That's that first block. Mm -hmm. All the words are one syllable. That's right. Okay. All. That's right. Yeah, I, I agree with Lee. It's, it, 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 there's, there's fewer two- and three-syllable words to confuse with. That's true. And so we a actually... a strong argument. So do people use that fact to factor out the kind of improvement you can get and then to see what the yeah. remaining can be explained okay. by what the other So as I, as I mentioned to Lee in our discussion earlier, there's a confound here, which is that the structure, the syllable structure, mm -hmm. is bound up with the entropy. And that it's not a coincidence. In fact, the structure of the syllable is bound up with the entropy. In a completely different talk, I actually show that the amount of entropy that words have is related to the intrinsic entropy of the phonetic constituents within. Okay. So in other words, this conventional wisdom that we're taught in introductory linguistics courses that there's an arbitrary relationship between sound and simple is not right. It's not, in, uh, it's not arbitrary. Um, it's not deterministic. It's something in between. But there's a huge correlation between the amount of lexical based entropy and the sound shape and syllable structure and prosodic structure of the words. So, so when this author, actually after this author did the experiment, did they realize, did they try to offer some explanation as to why there's a difference between polysyllabic and polysyllabic in terms of the difference? Well, I got this from yeah. Plum's book, oh, okay. okay, The Intelligent Ear. So I actually haven't read the original. Oh. I should have. Um, Plomp didn't interpret it that way at all. Um, he's just showing lots of data. He was trying to make the point that the word is the basic unit of speech perception, not the phone. But the data he shows in, his, in this chapter is not consistent with his hypothesis. He was honest enough to put all the data out there, but there are many reasons why the word by itself can't be the basic unit either. He was trying to say it's not the phone, which I would agree with. But he was saying that, look at all these data here. It's inconsistent with the phone being the basic unit. The word is more likely. But actually, what I interpret from this and the other data he showed was that the prosodic phrase is more likely to be a basic unit than the individual word. But it depends on what level. Remember the slide I showed earlier about the many different, yeah. So basically, this is really complicated. And the prosody could be used to parse at the phrasal level. And then you work, you drill deeper, you go within the phrase to decode the words, and you decode the uh, phonetic constituents if you need to, but only if you need to. But you first need to parse at a, larger, at a higher level. I think this is really important. And you, in a sense, do this in terms of rescoring. Your lattice rescorings are implicit recognition that you don't really have good confidence of the recognition of your individual phonetic uh, segments. You need language models and you need rescoring.
to sort of see what the probabilities are over a fairly long interval. That really is a huge win. And so you're essentially using an engineering kludge to uh, compensate for these lack of contacts, at least in my opinion. Okay, so visual cues. The brain really acts as a linear integrator. The visual cues provide far more intelligibility than you would predict on the basis of each of the streams alone. This is from a separate study done with Ken Grant in seven years ago. I'm not going to talk about the visual much, except I'm trying to train you as an audience for slides I'm going to show you at the very end, so I do need to mention the visual somewhat. What you can do is present two audio slits, which together give you about 20% of the words. This is a slightly different corpus than the one I showed you earlier, so it's a little bit easier to decode. The visual alone without the audio gives you 10%. When you combine the two, you get about 65, close to 65%. So huge synergy combining 19% and 11%. John Allen can't predict this from the articulation index approach. In fact, the standard for predicting speech intelligibility says we're not going to deal with the visual cues because they can't be accommodated within this framework. And the reason is that it's highly synergistic. The other weird thing is that if you desynchronize the audio and video streams, if the audio leads the video by even 40 milliseconds, you have a massive decline in intelligibility. But, but what, if, what if the human knows that there is a delay? Is that going to help? If you don't tell them, so the, so the listener has been maybe some kind of fool to think that they're synchronized. Of course, it will, it will actually, you know, uh, uh, it will create some horrible results. I don't think that that would matter much because if you listen to this, and unfortunately I don't have an example I can show you right now, I can show you after the talk, it becomes obvious by 40 milliseconds that they're desynchronized. There have been tests, and that is the threshold. So these people know that, in fact, they they're not that. synchronized. Okay. They're still, that's, their task is you decode the words you know, on pain of doing hours of this. So decode the words as best you can. And so the weird thing is that if the video leads the audio, you don't get that result. This is also a massive nonlinearity. Why on earth does the video leading the audio essentially not affect intelligibility until you're past well, about? Well, I mean, because in a normal speech, an audio-visual speech, video typically already leads yeah. over the audio for a certain type of sound, at least in a subset of sound. So maybe a human can get used to it, right? So maybe okay. it's an extended audio more people say, fine, you know, people make use of that. Yes. When I talk about just these data in a talk for an hour, I go through five different potential explanations, and there are usually several others. One of them is this, that this is the way we've learned it. It turns out that none of the standard explanations can actually fully account for this pattern versus this pattern. But yes, it's obviously uh, you can learn that, um, and it may help. But the fact that you have 200 milliseconds, and then kuchong, that's something that no model is able to predict. I have some of my own ideas, but I don't think it's really germane. I just want to illustrate some examples of synergy that make linear models of speech processing difficult to accept. Could you just briefly, what are the other explanations? Well, one has to do with the physical transit time. It's sort of related to Lee's, but it's sort of like um, speed of of sound is much slower than the speed of light, therefore, but it turns out that the functions would be parallel, not shaped so differently. Uh, neural transmission time. So uh, basically the visual system has uh, much uh, faster transmission. Some people, equal number of people say actually the auditory system is much faster transmission, but again, you'd have an offset and be parallel why in fact would you have this strange shape here and not for this one here? My own explanation has, is that there's something about 200 milliseconds. It's, it's average syllable length. There's a level of abstraction that with the video alone forces you into this level of analysis 
where you have 200 millisecond roughly buffers that keeps it in store to be combined with the audio which because the audio could be at not only the, uh, the syllable level but at the phone level, the feature level, um, you basically are not shunted into this. What we don't really understand is why the video preceding by as little as 40 milliseconds puts it into this mode of analysis. So there's a lot of unknowns that are not answerable with the data we have or any model that I'm aware of, which makes it interesting from a scientific point of yes, view. It could, yes. Um, it can count for many things. Um, and so in that sense, it's, it shunts it to this higher level of analysis because the video alone, that's the only level that the system can deal with. Okay, so what I'd like to talk about in the data portion, let's see, it's five after four, so it's half an hour. I have, what, about an hour or so? Yeah, yeah one hour. Okay, so I'm, I should be able to finish in 30 minutes. Um, I'm going to talk about the atomic physics of speech. And intelligibility, which is what I did for many years, is too crude a metric for understanding what's really going on in the brain. And you have to drill much deeper than that. And if you don't, you actually are fooled into thinking you understand things, but you don't. And I'm going to try to demonstrate that to you. So we're actually going to focus not on words, but on consonants and more importantly on phonetic features, which I'll describe what I mean in a minute for those of you who are unfamiliar. And we're going to actually show you how the auditory system does combine information across the acoustic frequency channel in terms of these phonetic features and derive consonants. And it's not what you think. It's uh, contradicting the conventional theory that channels are independent of each other. Yes. Well, so it goes much... Index. Uh, yeah, the whole articulation index, which is based on uh, Harvey Fletcher's work and his colleagues at Bell Labs in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, what they did wasn't wrong. It was just, you know, it was great work for the time. But the misunderstanding and misinterpretation of those data by other people like John Allen, though I understand even John is beginning to have a more reasonable way of looking at it. Um, that's the problem. And so I'm going to actually maintain that what he thinks is as normal in terms of independent channels of analysis, and that's why you can get product of errors to predict the intelligibility or the uh, constant recognition, is actually not straightforward, in fact, is unusual. Um, the independence of channels and the product of errors is a sign of synergy. And that's what he doesn't understand. It's not linear. See, he thinks of this as a linear integration across channels, and that is exactly wrong. He's got it exactly backwards. But, but, but on the other hand, I mean, you remember the book that, 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 that I sent you? Uh, yes. So that he, doesn't, uses, he doesn't correct the problems in that book. Well, but that uses that, uses that assum uh, independent assumption theory to predict all these confusion metrics, the yes. errors. And that prediction is so precise that uh, unless you offer some alternative account for all this data and show that the predictions of similar precision or something, you, it's kind of hard to dismiss that kind of assumption. Okay, so you so asked for it, here goes. Okay. So this is a slide at the end, after the end of my talk. So what's wrong with articulation theory? Um, first of all, the independence assumption is not correct. Uh, it turns out that like uh, Houthas and Steineken realize that they can't predict speech intelligibility that accurately, and so they actually have to tie adjacent channels together. This is work that was done in, 2000, in 1999 and 2000. I think this is really the misnomer to call that articulation theory. It has nothing to do with it. That's right. Essentially. Well, it's what, it's, what it's what Fletcher called it yeah, okay. because of the way he trained his speakers since this was days before digital computers or even tape recorders. That's an, uh, that's an historical so, so issue. Essentially, the theory says that uh, the channel of the channel are independent of each other. And yeah. That's what he called articulation theory. I mean, it's a sort of, sorry to be so harsh, John never did physiology in his life. He never really did auditory psychophysics in his life. If he really understood the details of how the auditory system really worked, 
he would realize it's a gross oversimplification to state or to think or to even test the hypothesis that the auditory system deals with purely independent channels. That's not what Fletcher really showed. He just never really understood what Fletcher and his colleagues actually did in terms of the critical band and the independence of channels. It's a misconception. Anyway, um, maybe we can talk about that afterwards. Um, so one of the problems with articulation uh, theory and the product of errors is that it only works if you take the entire consonant set into account. And all he's really doing is saying, okay, if you have consonants, that span the gamut of the frequency spectrum, as you do in English and most other languages, then you sort of get something that on average sort of works out. But it doesn't work for subsets of the, uh, of the consonants. And he doesn't really deal with the articulatory acoustic features in a principled way. Um, it's very strange, and he knows about these objections because he gave a talk at Berkeley a dozen years ago where Jeff Bilmes and I both started criticizing this whole approach, and he really didn't have good answers for it. He just said, well, this is the way it works. And in my view, that's not science. I'm not sure what it is. So let me go back. I think you'll understand where I'm going once I show you some data and show you some analysis and some interpretation. It's a very different perspective than looking at percent correct for different consonants. Let's see. Okay, so we're going to look at Danish. Why? Because I spend a portion of my year for the last four years in Denmark at the Technical University and that's where we did these experiments with Thomas Christensen and because we had access to speakers of Danish we used Danish consonants and so we're going to use these consonant identification tests to drill down to a much finer grain of analysis than is typically done because it's only when you do that do you see the real patterns and when you see these patterns it becomes very obvious what's really happening so this is the consonant set 11. Danish is the one of the strangest languages on earth. So I'm not going to go into what differs, but it has a very reduced consonant uh, inventory. We use three vowels. It has about 25 different vowels. It's a prosodic language, but okay. So what we did, this is sort of why I showed you before and demonstrated the slits with English sentences. We did something similar, but for Danish, consonants where they're embedded in a s sort of a syllable fella, bella, della, fella. So it's sort of a CVL with a little bit of a schwa. Their task was to identify that initial consonant. We pushed it through a spectral slit centered on one of these three frequencies, three quarters of an octave wide, single slit by itself, two slits, or three slits. Why this way? because I wanted a dynamic range where we had about 40% consonant recognition with single slits for each, of, each slit by itself gave roughly the same ID as the other slits. 90% ID here, so almost but not quite perfect so that any deviation from the three slit condition we would have a very accurate idea of what it was, if you had 100%, you wouldn't have that. Obviously, you'd have a ceiling effect. And it took two months for my colleague Thomas Christensen to determine the correct parameters. He got really tired. So why three quarters of octave? Uh, that has to do with the data we collected on a few pilot subjects. So if it was octave, you covered the whole, you covered the whole thing? Would it overlap? One octave, we probably... No, well, actually, because it's centered, it's like a ha it would be a half an octave. That would have meant that instead of 40%, we would have had maybe 50, 55%. It also is individual specific. Thomas, his data was such that we could have used a third of an octave and gotten 40%. Okay, okay. and I nine. Influence a fact of result. Yeah, we're trying, what we're trying to do, you know, like doing physics or biology experiments, you have to set the conditions exactly right. Mm 
because you have to have a rough idea of what you're looking for. You have to have a good idea of the parameters of the system in order to reveal the underlying processes in that system. Any physicist knows this, and any biologist worth their salt knows this, and therefore it's what you, I mean, you worked in a physiology lab for four years, you know this too. And therefore, you... No, 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 the, the real question is that if you were to use the... To validate the whatever capacity theory you have, does that theory become so... Uh, is it quantitative enough to predict that if you want three thirds of a tail, you can of predict course. this kind of, of course. prediction? Yes. Of yes. I mean, if you know, one, uh, one third of a tail, you might predict different things. But no, I don't think so. No, it would be similar. So. It, would be, it would be... The offset would be different, but the patterns would be similar, of course. We haven't done it on this data set, we could, and we probably should, but because we had limited time, we haven't. Um, uh, I, I have a question about, as the slit experiments become more and more prominent in your talk, I, mm. I, I, I want to ask this question. Sure. Um, is there a difference perceptually between uh, passing two-thirds of an octave at 1500 hertz and zeroing out the rest of the spectrum versus trying to mask the rest of the spectrum with some kind of constant noise. Yes. Um, and why would you choose this? In the second case, it seems yes. like humans would be trained to know that, oh, that sound could have been there underneath mm. the noise. Yes. And it would have been a better, yes. Uh, uh, yes. a less jarring way of masking yes. it Yes. So why do we use slits? Yes. So why do you use slits? Okay. So my colleague, Ken Grant, doesn't use slits except when he does experiments with me because he likes noise. Uh, one answer is he was trained to use noise and I wasn't. But the more uh, rigorous answer is that when you use noise, you have excitation in the auditory system. You don't really know what the excitation patterns are in response to this noise. There's an uncontrolled parameter here. I don't like uncontrolled parameters, personally. In that sense, I tend to be a little bit more obsessive. With slits, I have a much better idea about what is that signal that gets into the auditory system and what the likely auditory excitation patterns are associated with those slits. Whereas the background noise, there are many nonlinearities. I was an auditory physiologist for nine years. That's where I first met Lee. So he is an auditory physiologist in the early part of his career, too. You know that the nonlinearities that you get with noise can be immense, and you just don't want these unknown uh, effects. It's a complication. That's why. But if there is some kind of um, synthesis going on uh, of, these of these different bands, it seems like you'd want to feed it information that, oh, that signal could have been there. I don't want it because yeah. that, it may vary from person to person. Um, we do know that you can put noise in there and people do better, but it may vary. I just, it's a complicating factor for me. The other thing, there is an expression called ex expose the chinks in the perceptual armor. So in other words, you have a, you present signals that would never be presented in the real world as a way of exposing the underlying mechanisms and f try to foil the strategies your subjects may use to identify we're really interested in what's really going on in the brain. And the best way I know of is to have signals that really stress the system and where the success of the subject and the patterns of errors of the subject, even more important, as I'll show you, reveal what's really going on. I mean, this is really physics, essentially. It's conceptually and philosophically, it's very much like the atom smashers, that we spend billions of dollars. To really understand the underlying forces of nature, you have to resort to extreme experiments like this. Sorry. So, I'm not going to talk about another component except maybe in passing towards the end, but we actually did low pass filter the modulation spectrum because we were interested in both the spectral and the temporal stuff. And it's interesting, but it's not, it's off the main point of today's talk. So I'll just refer to this later in passing, but you should know 
that we did low pass filter the modulation spectrum uh, at these cutoff frequencies here. So these are the data. Now if I were John Allen or about 95% of my colleagues in speech perception, we would end the talk right here. So yeah, you get like 40% uh, for the three slits by themselves. You do much better for two slits and you get about 90%. And if you low pass filter the modulation spectrum, you decrease the consonant recognition. So, so End of story. Can be predicted from uh, Fletcher theory. Yeah, but this is, pardon me, I, I know this may be recorded, this is bullshit. This is, this is not informative. All this tells you is that there's some impact of these spectral temporal manipulations. It doesn't reveal the underlying mechanisms. It doesn't prune the alternatives for your explanation. This is what's wrong with most of speech perceptions. What's wrong with it's, what's wrong with most of psychology? Actually, there are too many alternatives, and I think you're like me. I don't want alternatives. I want one ex, one logical interpretation if I can. So your different theory probably can predict the same similar kind of numbers. Yeah, the numbers are irrelevant. It's the information associated with the consonant identification tasks that are really important. And so 50 years ago, George Miller, probably maybe the single most brilliant speech perception researcher ever. Um, this was only six years after Shannon and Weaver. And he combines information theory and a monograph published in 1952 by Jakobsen, Font, and Holly decomposing consonants into their phonetic features. He combined the two into a brilliant experiment. And we're going to use a very similar paradigm, but go much further than he did. And so we have these three different um, phonetic features. Some of you may be familiar with this. Some of you may not. The last time I gave a talk here, I think only 10% of the audience knew what phonetic features were. So I'll give you some examples. When you're producing speech and there are acoustic manifestations of the production apparatus, you have essentially three separate production aspects. One of which has to do with how the sound is generated. That's called manner. You can have airflow coming through the, no the nose because of the nasal port being open. You can have the vocal tract being maximally open, large amounts of energy coming out, uh, not complete closures, ah, e, u, vowels. You can have a complete closure, like when the lips come together, that's a stop. Okay, I think that's probably as much as you need to know. You probably know this anyway. Whether, in fact, the larynx is vibrating or not, it's also important for energy buildup. If you have a loud if you have an intense part of the speech signal, it's got to be voiced. If it's very low in, uh, in intensity, it's probably unvoiced. P -p 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 versus n -n or b -b 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 -b, much more energy. But it's mainly at the larynx, but it has clear acoustic signature. Place of articulation, where the maximum occlusion takes place. Uh, for the P, it's at the front of the mouth. If it were for the K, it would be at the back of the mouth, or T would be in between, and so on. You also can do that for, for vowels, and so on. And so from these three different componential features, you can basically build up a complete set of the consonants. And I show that here for Danish. So P unvoiced, the larynx isn't vibrating complete closure and the place of articulation front and so on here. And you can use this uh, lookup table now to do analysis of the error patterns where the task was identify the consonant. Not whether it's voiced or not, just identify the consonant, but because you have associations of each consonant with this set of features here, you can essentially do a feature analysis. Yeah, so I don't understand. So if that feature system actually specify all classes of speech sounds, why is it that in doing all these perception experiments that I know of, like Nice Little Miller and some mm -hmm. experiment you're doing, only limit yourself into carcinoma rather than 
Okay, that's because the consonants and the vowels are fundamentally different types of segments. But the, the features are similar, right? They no, they're, 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 not, they're not really similar. They are represented as similar, but they're not. Okay, so in other words, the same front feature and profile in consonant will be have different names. It's wrong. It's wrong-headed. Okay, so you should actually label front in that front. That's level right. That, versus yeah, this, this, is, this is an oversimplification. Okay, yeah. That's the point. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, in theory, forget it. Um, one is discrete. One is more con analog, continuous. There are many other reasons why. We can talk about that afterwards. I just want to make sure in the few minutes remaining that I get through these data because they're really interesting. So we're actually going to look, do detailed error analysis. And the error analysis turns out to be crucial for understanding what the auditory system is doing here. So you probably have seen these confusion matrices in other contexts. So we basically have the stimulus, what was presented. If you basically respond P, hey, it's correct. If you respond something else, it's wrong. What we're going to look at are the patterns of errors when you don't correctly identify. So voicing errors, so P versus B, for example, K versus G, relatively few and far between in our data and in general. And Miller nicely also showed this is not novel. Manner, the difference between mistaking a fricative and a nasal, a fricative and a stop, more common, but not that much more common in these data. You'd need lots of background noise to start to get manner errors. And that's what Milo nicely did. Um, but for place of articulation, the difference between a P and a T, or a T and a K, huge numbers, probably about 80% of the errors that you see in these sorts of experiments Place of articulation. Again, Miller nicely knew this. Very vulnerable to both background noise and to the slits. And the question is why and can we use this to actually understand what's happening? And the answer is yes, you can. Because so this is really where Miller nicely stopped. It's a shame because George Miller had the intelligence to go further. Unfortunately, a terrible thing happened to him. He, chained, he started doing experiments in a different area the magical number seven plus or minus two short term memory made him world famous. He stopped doing this type of research the next year and never went back to it. Shame, tragedy. Anyway, what Miller did six years after Shannon and Weaver was to use a mutual information theoretic uh, analysis metric where you're compensating for the probability of the token either at the consonant level or at the feature level and you're essentially counting for response bias and coming up with a single number that encapsulates essentially the ability of the listener to distinguish reliably in a signal detection sort of way between one consonant and another or more importantly between one feature and another. And having one number that encapsulates how good you distinguish like P from everything else is wonderful. Why can't you use percent correct? Well, you could get 100% correct on P, but that's because everything you're presented with is labeled as P. It's meaningless. So this essentially gives you a score of how well P was uh, correctly recognized relative to everything else and it also gives you the response bias metric and it penalizes you for that. So I like this uh, metric and that's actually what we use. So we don't change anything that Miller nicely did in that sense. We just use it in a different way. So they didn't use slits. They used background noise. And some of our results are very similar and consistent with what they got. So Remember I told you we low-pass filtered the modulation spectrum? I'm not really going to focus on that here except to say, isn't it nice that if you look at the information computed, and this is for consonants, the total, you have three and a half bits of information because there are 11 alternatives, fine. So you get a progressive degradation of information as you low-pass filter the modulation spectrum. It's what you would expect. But we're not going to look at that. We're going to look at really what happens when you combine individual slits 
and compare it to two and three slits. But in theory, they should be monotonically related to each other, the information measure versus error rate. Right? They're so not. They are not? They're not. Yeah, not, not super I'll monotonic show you why. Not in terms of information. No, they're not. No? Okay. That's the interesting thing. Uh -huh. They're not. If it were, this would be a trivial talk. So, and I'll, I think I can explain to you why they're not. And that's even more interesting. So, let's look at voicing. It's one bit of information because there are two alternatives. So, one of the nice things about information theoretic analysis is that for the manner, we had three alternatives. For place, three alternatives. So, inherently, the same amount of maximum information with very different patterns, as I'll show you. So, it's not the response alternative number. For voicing, you have only two. That metric takes care of the fact that you have two versus three. I want, for reasons I won't go into, it was much better to show you the absolutes than the normalized. But it doesn't change the pattern of data, of course. You're just, you know, uh, dividing by a common uh, denominator. Notice that when you add these two together, these are single slits, you get things that look sort of like linear combinations here, but it saturates for three. And what we're going to look at now is this for different um, features. For manner, also it looks almost linear across frequency. Again, it, there's some saturation, not quite as much for voicing. But again, this progressive decline. So we have some internal consistency with what you would expect. In other words, the information theoretic measure seems to be roughly doing the right things. But if you put the error rate up there, you probably have similar trends. It has to be. You get more, less and less, fewer and fewer. Yes, but not in ways that show the patterns clearly. In the paper which we've published and we've submitted, we show those. It, it, the percentages while the trends are consistent, they don't show you the patterns clearly enough. Place of articulation. Notice that here the amount of information for single slits is very low, and you have much more information associated with the two and three slits. So we're going to look at this in a quantitative way. So let's look at a, sorry, a quantit let's look at a linear combination first. This is probably for, uh, probably for manner. So this is real data. I've just excerpted it just to make it clear. One slit by itself, you have uh, about half a bit, just less than half a bit. You put them together. Uh, in terms of two slits that are presented, you get about one bit. And now you essentially add the uh, information associated with these two independent slits, compare it to the two slits presented concurrently, virtually identical, so the quotient here is 1. That's linear in terms of information. Yeah, but it's very hard to say that because, because that information really is just a function of everything. Huh? Everything in the computer matrix. So... Yeah, hear me out, because um, I agree with you, you can't put too much stock in the individuals, but look at the overall patterns and you'll see what I'm getting at. But that's why if, if you use the error, uh, the confusion errors, error rate, you won't be able to get anything. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is the opposite extreme from a place of articulation excerpt from the confusion matrix. What you see is you, know, you basically combine these two, you get about 0.2, but in reality what the listener gets is much better, nearly four times more than you would predict on the basis of linear integration across the frequency spectrum. That's for place of articulation. Yes, yes. So that's synergy. Okay. Because, because, I mean, if just from spectral analysis, I would roughly know that, you know, like in stop constant level place, if you just put some additional information, of course, you get enhancement. Okay, because we can they talk. It's distributed in a very not uniform way. I mean, I think everything here is showing. It, it's way. not, okay, it makes so sense. Conventional acoustic cues in special way. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. There's much more spectral granularity associated with place. But you're in a, okay. It, it's not surprising, but let me go further and you'll see there are some interesting conclusions that I think are somewhat counterintuitive. You can now quantify this where the front rows essentially are with no modulation um, uh, filtering. What you can see is that for place of articulation, there's lots of synergy 
across the acoustic frequency spectrum. And until you do severe low-pass filtering of the modulation spectrum, there is very little synergy, because one is basically linear or something close to it. It's only when you get to numbers like two or greater that you get substantial amounts of synergy. So notice that voicing manner and total, the consonant idea appears to be linear. It's not linear. It's only because the nonlinear component of the consonant recognition is being masked by these two features here. And I'm going to show you more data that show you why this is a major problem for models based just on consonants and the articulation index. So if someone who uh, was a, a firm believer in the articulation index were to break it out uh, in the same way, mm. they, you're, they would see this uh, same pattern, but just not as clearly as what you're saying. Uh, yeah, in fact, uh, some of you may know Hannes Musch. He published some papers in 2001 in JASA. Um, where he did a slit experiment where he thought of it as a natural extension of the articulation index. Um, and he had never done phonetic feature analysis. And he heard a talk I gave shortly after his publications, and he said, I, I'm getting exactly the same thing that you're showing. This was for English, not for the Danish stuff. So I'm pretty confident that if you reanalyzed your data, you'd see something very similar. Very similar, yeah. So what's wrong with the conventional approach is encapsulated with this slide. And this is not the first place I'm going to show the slide. Look at the correlation between consonant identification and precision of getting the feature associated with it right. What this really means is that if you get the consonant wrong, the place of articulation is almost always wrong. And I'll show you another slide that demonstrates that as well. You can get the place, you can get the consonant wrong and still get voicing or manner correct. I mean 80, 90 percent even when you only get half the consonants wrong. That is very, very, very important and significant, particularly if you're doing machine recognition. This is something you really need to understand here. The fact that place of articulation and consonant ID essentially are one and the same. Now, remember what I showed you earlier that if you look at this in terms of integration across frequency channels, it appears linear. It's only place of articulation that really shows the synergy. But given that you need place of articulation to decode the consonant, the inherent process of identifying the consonant is inherently synergistic and nonlinear. Okay. Uh, the implication here is that if you want to truly get the consonant correct in a way that doesn't depend in mostly on your language models, which often it, it can't because you have too much confusability. Your language models can only go so far. What this really means is that you have to have models that combine your analysis in acoustic frequency region A, low, mid, and high, correctly. And this combination of recognizers that people like at ICSI Morgan and Morgan students tried for years, this multiband. Yeah, but they assume that they're independent of each other. Huh? Yes, they're wrong. They're, the, the way their combination strategies were not well informed. They, they made certain assumptions that were not correct. And so the multiband project was doomed to not get very impressive gains because they never really realized that the type of combination strategies they would need to use had to be far more sophisticated than what they used. So, so you think that they kind of really might contribute to the combination how to combine, yes. you know, but now they are using all discriminative training to do with some kind of clearing. Yeah, I mean, discriminative training can pull a lot of this out. See, my interpretation of ASR is that you have very clever engineering uh, tr algorithms and strategies that compensate for a lot of the deficiencies of your underlying models. So as a scientist, I say, why not get the models correct 
and then use the computational resources more productively. So uh, I'm going to go out and limb and say this is probably, so if you look at the state of the art speech recognition systems out there, I would say integrating over the frequency domain is probably one of the places that recognizers are, are doing it reasonably correctly today. Now, they might not be detailed enough or do it exactly the right way, but the model, the standard model has many flaws, but I don't think this is one of the worst ones. Well, maybe things have changed since 2000. Uh, in 2000, I was asked by the NSA to do a phonetic analysis of the errors and even the non-errors in eight different speech recognition systems. Microsoft was not among them, but IBM, AT&T, Cambridge, Hopkins, uh, SRI. And we looked at the ability to correctly recognize the phonetic segments, both consonants and vowels, both in free, unconstrained recognition, as well as with forced alignment where you had the word transcript. Okay? And the question is, how well did the sites do? And we even scored in two different ways, lenient versus strict, which ultimately became the origin of what ears used. But it was Sean Chong who actually first figured out how to change the recognition performance based on the lean. That's a side effect. Um, basically, unconstrained recognition, you got about 50% of the phones wrong. 50%. That totally makes sense to me. Yeah. And the model is not great, yeah. but I'm just saying, in terms of the modeling, the, that, the ability to integrate over the frequency domain like that, I think we already do that. We might not do it in exactly the right way. That's right. You, that's right. you do integrate across frequency. That's right. absolutely true. Uh, I also agree with you that you probably don't do it in the optimal way. That's right. That's exactly right. So it's not like I'm saying your ASR systems are completely full of it. They don't work. Of course they work. But under many conditions where you have problems now, if you change the underlying way in which you combine information across frequency, it might do better. But I'm going to show you some data in the last few slides that indicates that there's another source of information that could be as useful and which is not currently being used by recognition systems that I'm aware of. And that actually I needed to show you these data. Um, so maybe I should, I don't, there's a flow of speech processing that's related to it. Do I have 10 minutes or five minutes? Um, yeah, maybe 10 minutes, yes. Okay. So one thing you can do is to look at these confusion matrices and the error patterns in terms of what happens when a consonant is correctly identified and which features are decoded correctly and vice versa. So in other words, what you're now looking at is the relationship between the errors in features, both in terms of when they're correctly identified and some others are not and vice versa. And it's this sort of symmetry of the error pattern investigations that tell you something very interesting here. And I, I just want to give you a flavor of this to tell you what you can actually learn from this, which is that if you're looking for the probability of decoding like manner, whether it's a stop or a nasal or fricative, is high given voicing is correct, and the probability of decoding manner is low given that voicing is wrong, then you can deduce that manner decoding depends on voicing because it's an asymmetry. And this is actually what you see in these data. And the same does not tr hold true for voice in given manner. What this implies is that manner has to be decoded prior to manner. There's no other way to get this type of error pattern. And you can do the same thing for manner and place. And what you can actually deduce is that place decoding depends on manner, which is consistent with experiments I did ma with machine learning seven years ago. And it implies that the manner is decoded prior to place. Okay, so in some sense you can actually um, deduce what the phonetic flow of processing is and it sort of tells you that if you're building up a recognition system you want to, you basically need to know what the voicing and the manner are before you can correctly decode place. 
If I were to change one single thing in terms of what you normally do, I would say you get that voicing and manner as accurate as possible. That will simplify your place of articulation decoding. We know this to be true because Sean Chang, my investor, and I did this in a different corpus with machine learning, not perception, and proved this is correct. So this perceptual experiment is consistent with what we know to be true for at least the consonant recognition uh, neural network that we designed about seven, seven years ago. Isn't, isn't it also, cons uh, it seems like it's possible this analysis is confusing uh, correlation with causality. That maybe it's just hard to decode manner. And once you can't decode manner, then you can't decode place. Um, perhaps, but I don't think that's true. Um, I think there are many aspects of manner that actually suggest that it's much simpler to decode than place. Miller and Nicely actually were able to show, and our data are consistent with that, that in terms of the span of the acoustic frequency spectrum that is necessary to correctly decode voicing, very narrow. That's why we see a saturation uh, with two slits. Three slits, it doesn't add anything more for matter, only a little bit. In Miller Nicely study, they show that in terms of the bandwidth of the signal, um, they didn't use slits. They just uh, had a sort of almost continuous bandwidth variation. But they showed the same thing. Narrow bandwidth uh, saturates uh, to max maximum for voicing. Just a little bit broader for manner. For place, it doesn't saturate. It's linear. Right. You, full bandwidth. That gets back to what's different about place. The spectral granularity required for place of articulation means that you'll take as much of the spectrum as possible. This is one of the reasons why noise is so destructive of consonant recognition. And since consonants are crucial for lexical discrimination, it's why noise can be destructive to decoding the speech signal for humans and for machines. So this is a phonetic feature chart where I propose that, like in image processing, coarse features, voicing first, followed by manner, followed by place, and only then do you actually get the consonant ID. Now, with context, you can actually do, you don't actually have to follow this. But if you don't have context or you have highly confusable items, you probably do have to follow that. I want to go back to the context effect that I showed you earlier here. And now I want to go back to this slide here. So voice, what does it mean that you get the consonant wrong, but you've actually got the manner and voicing correct? Think about the implications of that. That means that you actually have a lot of information about the speech signal that could be used. Is it used? I believe the answer is yes. Because what is there about voicing and manner that's different from place? And that is, these are energy features in different time scales. Voicing is a syllabic feature. In the multi-tier theory, which you can read about in uh, a book I've edited, um, I, can, I demonstrate that voicing really responds, uh, it operates on the level of the syllable, which is roughly around 200 milliseconds on average. Manner is more temporally isomorphic with phonetic segments, so 80, 100 milliseconds. Place is not sensitive to prosody. It's stable. This is one of the reasons why place of articulation is stable under many conditions, both in speaking um, and in prosody and in dialects. Uh, it's a very stable feature. And it makes sense since the prosody is what varies across dialect region. It's what varies across genetically related languages. If you look at related words across languages with hundreds of years of time separation, the place of articulation is stable, not the manner and the voicing. Wait, 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 wait. But everything here is assuming that your speech utterance actually is kind of in the rest style. The assimilation effect is weak. Right? But in the running speech, now this is very often you get this assimilation, so the feature itself changes. Well, OK, it changes. So the multi-tier theory predicts exactly the changes in the feature expression that you get. And what it says is that 
if it's a prosodic sensitive feature as voicing and manner it can alter in certain systematic ways it's not arbitrary if it's a place feature it's not prosodic it doesn't change and it does not change the separate issue also so example i think give example like uh, it's robust it's, it's stable yes sure. across all languages i believe so every language i know of and i've presented this in many audiences, as far as we can tell, it's a universal, yes. But in that case, do you have to, uh, to predict the assimilation first? Like for, yeah, example, no, example. you don't, because the assimilation is a prosodic feature in the multi-tier system. Okay? And so what it does is it affects the prominence of the syllables. It affects the phonetic expression of the constituents of the syllables, but in predictable ways. So you know, the, the place you're talking about here is after the assimilation. Yeah. So well, it's not okay. Lexical. It's not lexical place. No. It is the, uh, no. the, the, the kind of, kind of phonetic. Uh, so the assimilation does not affect the onset place, except in conditions where it's an unstressed syllable where there's very little entropy. So entropy is the ultimate controlling parameter here. Prosody is the most direct reflection of entropy. The phonetic constituents and their expression are a reflection of the prosody. So in a sense, the phonetic expression is also sensitive to the entropy, but it's a much more indirect relationship. I mean, that's why I think you should be interested in this, because it ultimately gives you a much better way of predicting the variability. So what I think is really happening is that you first do a coarse analysis in terms of coarse energy that is fluctuating in syllable-like intervals. And where you're first doing a prosodic analysis and the manner and the voicing are prosodic features, they're energy features. So in noisy situations, even though you might not be able to extract the place of articulation in isolation or without any other information, you do have access to the prosodic information which is often robust in noise and distortions. And because your lexicon internally is stored not just in terms of sequences of phones, but in terms of stress patterns, syllable structure, syllable, uh, how do we know this? Tip of the tongue. If you can't remember a word, what you can remember about it is usually the number of syllables. You can remember the stress pattern, and you usually remember the consonant at the onset, particularly if it's a stressed syllable. And so you actually have different granularities of representations. So when you have a noisy background, you actually can use coarse features to prune the alternatives, like what you're doing with your recognition systems. So in this multi-tier structure, very coarse analysis first, just like the image processing, the visual system. Then you go to an intermediate analysis where you pick off the phonetic constituents within these syllabic intervals. And there you try to say, well, what type, is it a, is it a fricative, is it a stop, um, is it a vowel here? This already prunes things because if you have some idea what's being spoken, just having this without knowing the exact identity of the segments is often enough for you to deduce what in fact the word is. And then finally, if this coarser information is not enough, you then can resort to place of articulation. This is where the visual signal is very, very important. And so Ken Grant, raised an objection after I gave this uh, talk in Denmark a few months ago. And he said, actually, um, the course, when you have the visual signal, it's just the opposite. You go from fine to coarse. And I, my comment then was, but I'm talking about utterances, not about individual monosyllables and out of context. And, but I thought about it more, and I realized that he's exactly wrong. The reason is, Place of articulation in whispered speech doesn't help you. Why? Should, according to Ken. And the reason is that whispered speech, you don't have voicing 
you need this energy substrate to hang the place of articulation information and if it's mainly from the visual channel, you have nothing to hang it on. So this theory can actually predict data. What benefit does the visual cues give you for whispered speech? It tells you place of location difference, right? Do you know anyone who's actually shown this? I don't, know. I, don't, I don't know anyone who has either. Okay. Yeah. I think intuitively it should be very useful, just like in the voice speech. Yeah, I don't think it is. And see, so the theory, see, the, the power of this theory, and I haven't told you most of the predictions of the theory, many of which either have never been published or I didn't know about. So the theory was designed to account for a body of data, most of which I haven't shown you. It has to do with the switchboard corpus. And what it predicts among other things, is that the McGurk effect, when you combine auditor, audio and visual, it predicts that the McGurk effect will fail under certain very specific contexts. And these data are not published. I had to ask Ken. No one publishes negative results. And it predicts that where you have unambiguous acoustics, you don't get a McGurk effect. And that's form and transitions are inherently ambiguous Therefore, the visual has the opportunity. So the theory can actually predict things that it was never designed to, which is the real value of a, of a theory, that it goes much further than the original data upon which it was based. So I haven't done the experiment that I've mentioned, but I don't know of a study. But maybe we'll do that this summer in Denmark. But I would be amazed if, in fact, the place of articulation information from the visual cues helps in uh, in whispered speech, and the explanation is you actually, to do the place of articulation analysis, you need the voicing component if the visual information, which is almost 95% of the visual cues are place of articulation, then that would actually explain it. But I'm fairly sure that if you get some benefit, it's very small. In voice speech, it's about 15 to 20 decibels. It's a difference between getting 90% of the words and 10% of the words at low signal-to-noise ratios. It's huge. And no one has in, been... In either case, the video information does tell you the place of the right? That's obvious. So why isn't that information? It, it does under certain conditions and only certain conditions. No, and the reason why you can go from 10% intelligibility to 90% intelligibility is, I mean, remember, the spectral information is the same, it's noisy. Why does a single channel then g allow you to decode the consonants correctly? It's not that it's suddenly giving you the spectrum. It's that it's giving you certain information that is interacting with the audio in a no, synergistic so, so way. It's, it's, There's no other explanation. So you're, you're saying that it's it's not because it doesn't help, but it's... It, it, it only helps in certain conditions. And psychologists are terrible at stressing their theory and doing real tests. That's why they don't publish negative results. Like, no one has ever published... So are you saying that it's not useful or under... Uh, under... under in whisper... In whisper it's not uh, synergistic. So these are two different things. No, in, in whispered... Um, I, I can't distinguish between the two. My, my sense no, no, is that... If the wisdom speech, you get about maybe 20% uh, you know, uh, identification rate, and this was 20%, the result will be 40% or still 20%? It can I, be just still 20%. Right? This, 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 this okay, the visual alone for those sentences yes, 20%. Was, yeah. ten, was actually 10%. 10%, okay. And the so, alone is, uh, maybe wisdom speech so I, I would say that it will be a minimal gain. It will not be synergistic. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm willing to bet on yeah, that. That's what I mean. oh, okay. willing to, not, we could do the experiment. I think maybe we will this summer. Okay. Um, but it was only because of Ken being so challenging and so certain that I thought about it. I said, wait a minute. Ken is making certain assumptions that are almost certainly not right. And no one has actually really ever tested this. They just assumed. So my, the, the model associated with this part of the theory says that to get benefit of the visual
cues, you have to have an energy contour to hang it on. It's a very specific prediction. And if you don't, I challenge anyone to come up with another alternative explanation. There may be some. Okay, so I'm, I think I'm done here. So I promised you this, so you can just read it. I think I've already told you uh, this basically. You know, you deal with time frames that are maybe one or two or three years, but if you're dealing with 10-year time horizons, you can start to think about how you can combine this sort of approach into future generations uh, systems. You at Microsoft are really in a unique or almost unique situation. You can think in 10-year time horizons, whereas most people can't. So if anyone is actually going to think about how to do this, you are because the company will be around in 10 years, probably in 20 or 30 years. And so you actually have the resources to do it. Universities don't because graduate students graduate, postdocs go on. Um, most companies um, don't have this luxury of thinking in the long term. That's why I came here to encourage you to think about this other way. A lot of what I tell you, told you here may not be exactly right, but that's not important. What is important is that it encourages you to think a little bit differently than what you've been doing so far. I would, be e I would uh, love for you to show that certain things that I've shown here are not correct. That in fact, show me what really is going on. But use some of these data and these paradigms to change the way in which you do classification, combine information, and I think you'll f come up with some very interesting algorithms that will do much better under certain conditions than you might otherwise predict. Then you can explain why. Okay, so thank you very much for your time and attention and questions.